Please take your Bibles in and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, as we continue our verse-by-verse study through the epistle of 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16, reading from the New Authorized Version. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of behavior. As it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this is indeed your holy word, as it says in Romans 1 2. These are words that you have spoken, they are words of truth, they are words to which we must submit. It's our rule and practice for life. It's a word that will judge us. Many a man can live comfortably without the Bible, but no man can die comfortably without it. Those who refuse to have the word as a guide will be forced to submit to it as a judge. Dear Heavenly Father, these are solemn words. These are words that are profound. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that your spirit would convict us of the truth of these words and apply them to our minds, hearts, and our wills today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the context, in verses 13 through 21, we are in a new section in Peter's epistle that begins with a therefore. And you and I ask ourselves, what's the therefore? Therefore, a therefore looks back and it looks forward simultaneously. Uh, Therefore introduces the doctrine of sanctification. How do we increase in pleasing God? How do we increase in holiness? We listen to the therefore. The therefore looks back at the doctrine and it looks forward to the practice. It's a call for people to make application. A therefore is exhortation. Exhortation calls people. it's It's a warning to people with a view towards judgment or accountability. Sometimes it's comfort. Sometimes it's counsel but it's always intended to bind the conscience and bring about a change in behavior. In verses 1 through 12, Peter describes what God has done for the believers in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And Peter describes the supreme value of God's gracious salvation in Christ in God's redemptive plan through Christ and his cross work. What is redemption? It's not the same as salvation. It's the means to the end, which is salvation. Redemption is deliverance by the payment of a price. Redemption is an act of God in which he himself pays the ransom for sin, which has outraged his holiness. Peter describes the involvement of the Trinity in verse 2. And remember, when we look at the Trinity, they are three persons in one essence. And you and I need to remember that the Trinity acts together concurrently. Sometimes scripture, a certain passage or verse may emphasize, you know, one person of the Godhead more than the other. But always remember that they act concurrently and they're all involved in every aspect of creation and redemption. Then in verses 3 through 5 is the certain inheritance of believers. That inheritance we need to glory in and begins with eulogia, blessed be God. And remember, as Hodge says, that's the highest veneration and honor that can be ascribed to God, eulogia, to speak well of God, raised to the highest level. And it's only used of God in Scripture, and it's used three times. In Ephesians 1.3, 2 Corinthians 1.3, and 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be God. Then in verses 6 through 9, we have the joy and love of believers in God. And remember, the joy and love is there only because He first loved us, then we love. 1 John 4.19. And then in verses 10 through 12, the privileges that we have as New Testament believers to be living in this church age, the time of fulfillment of God's promises as to salvation in Christ, promises, divine intentions for the future that are sure as to God's actions, which bring comfort to his people. Verses 1 through 12 are in the indicative mood. What does that mean? In the Greek, it means it describes what God has already done for us in Christ. That's the indicative mood. And that's followed in verses 13 through 21. Peter changes to the imperative mood, the mood of command there in the Greek. How then should we live in light of what God has already done for us? The indicative comes first, what God has already done for us in Christ, followed by the imperative then, the demands how then we should live 
in light of what Christ has already done for us. You flip that around, you put the imperative first before the indicative, and you end up with a works righteousness, a works religion that is not biblical and not the gospel. So what Peter does is then he highlights here the accomplished grace of salvation in Christ. He moves from describing the nature of salvation in 1 through 12, and then in verses 13 through 21, our responsibility. In 1976, Francis Schaeffer published a major work, which was also made into a film and a TV series, and I'm sure many of us have seen it over the years, but it's entitled, How Should We Then Live? It was a historical review of Western civilization detailing the rise and decline of Western thought and culture. He cited in reality there are only two worldviews. There's the anthropocentric worldview that puts God or man at the center, and then there's the theocentric worldview that puts God at the center. And Schaefer said that people function on the basis of their worldview more consistently than even they themselves realize. And a worldview is a network of presuppositions which are not tested by natural science in which every element of human experience is related and interpreted as to reality, which is metaphysics, conduct, which is ethics, and knowledge, which is epistemology. People function on the basis of their worldview more consistently than even they themselves realize. The problem, Schaefer says, is not in outward things. Rather, he said, the problem is having and acting upon the right worldview. The worldview which gives men and women the truth of what is. Schaefer exhorted all Christians with a theocentric worldview to live differently from the world around them with their anthropocentric or man-centered worldview. As Christians, we're to live our lives in all things in the light of what God has already done for us in Christ. Schaefer said this, Christian values cannot be accepted as a superior utilitarianism, just as a means to an end. The biblical message is truth. It demands a commitment to truth. It means that everything is not the result of the impersonal plus time plus chance, but there is an infinite personal God who is the creator of the universe, the space-time continuum. We should not forget that this was what the founders of modern science built upon. It means the acceptance of Christ as Savior and Lord. And it means living under God's revelation. Here there are morals, values, and meaning, including meaning for people, which are not just a result of statistical averages. This is neither a utilitarianism nor a leap away from reason. It is the truth that gives a unity to all of knowledge and all of life. Individuals come to the place where they have this basic, this influence on the consensus. And he says such Christians do not need to be a majority in order to have this influence over society. My prayer for us is that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit that guides us into truth, would impress again upon us the indicative doctrines of Scripture, what Christ has already done for us, God has already done for us in Christ, and then the Spirit would also convict us to live lives that evidence that we are indeed in Christ, that we're committed to truth, that we are Christians. And as that I-A-N ending means in Latin, it means that we are members of the tribe of Christ. We are part of God's family. We are adopted children of God in Christ. That we live to His glory and we affirm that we are endeavoring to please God in all things, that we are progressing in our holiness, a holy walk, a daily commitment to holiness, and we are confirming that our conscience is attuned to the fruit that is evidenced in our lives, that gives evidence that, yes, indeed, our names are written in the book of life, that we are chosen pilgrims of God. Are we truly God's children? The first point this morning is God's children are obedient children. God's children are obedient children. The beginning of verse 14, as obedient children. I ask this question, can a believer truly call himself a Christian without being obedient? And the answer is no. Otherwise, we will be as what Jerry Bridges says, practical apostates. You come to church 
meeting place on the Lord's Day to worship, say all the right words in that, and yet you go out the door and you live for the world during the day, during the week. And Romans 8.13 says, those who live according to the flesh, it is death. You cannot truly be a believer in Jesus Christ without living a life of obedience. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Matthew 7, 18 through 20, a good, fruit, a good tree brings forth good fruit, a bad tree bad fruit. Wherefore, by their fruit you shall know them. We've shared over this pulpit many times. Remember the, the Reformers, Saving Faith, that acronym, CAT, the consensus, the census, and truth. You have to have all three to have saving faith. Consensus, you affirm that this is God's word. It's a word of truth. The census, it moves you biblically. What you adhere to and say is true, moves your entire being. It affects you. And lastly, trust. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You must have all three for saving faith. James 4.17, therefore, to him that knows good and does it not, to him it is sin. Howard Hendricks, who taught at Dallas Theological Seminary, says in the New Testament, to know and not to do is not to know at all. W.E. Vine, when a man obeys God, he gives the only possible evidence in his heart that he believes God. Tozer said this, trust and obey are the two sides of a Christian, like the two sides of a coin. You can't just pass one side. You must have both. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. As obedient children, believers are to do God's will just as obedient children obey their parents. Isn't that right, Samantha? That's right. Obedient children obey their parents. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The phrase reminds us that believers in Christ are begotten of God. Look with me at chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope, which is eternal life, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Look at verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Then look at chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes, desiring the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Peter reminded his readers and us as, as believers that we do not... that. That to not to do the will, we do not do the will of God in our own strength. We do it by God's initiative. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Progressive sanctification. You and I are to evidence that in our lives. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility. The doctrine of concurrence, flowing together worth. God works in and through everything that goes on in the universe, including human actions without coercion, to bring his decrees to pass. God's sovereign over the means as well as the end. The Christian life is not passive. I remember a couple years ago, right down here at the Texaco gas station, I had a breakfast and a conversation with a man from another denomination in town. And literally, he argued with me over the phrase, let go and let God. That was the modus operandi of his life. And I told him that that was not biblical. Let go and let God teaches an unbiblical doctrine of sanctification. Let go and let God teaches passive sanctification. And our sanctification, our daily walk in holiness and increasing and pleasing God is not passive. It is proactive. Yes, it depends on God's sovereignty, for its ultimate fulfillment, but we are responsible. Everything begins and ends with God, but there's the responsibility 
that we have as his children throughout, that is God ordained. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him brings forth much fruit, but without me you can do nothing. The Greek word in verse 14 for children is techna. Techna is the theme word in 1 John. Seven times it's found in 1 John. But what it does, it emphasizes relationship. It emphasizes the dependency of the infant on the parent and the weakness of the infant that gets its strength from the parent that needs the strength of the parent to accomplish anything. James 2.26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Acts 2.36, Peter said, those at Pentecost, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom you've crucified is both Lord and Christ. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord and do not the things which I say? This was the real danger of the Lordship salvation controversy, which was all the rage in the 90s and has spilled over into the 21st century, down stemmed from Dallas Theological Seminary. And what that essentially said is that you could come to suppose it's saving faith in Christ, and then later on, you could come to repentance and to acknowledging Jesus as Lord in your life. That's unbiblical. Colossians 2.6 says, As you have therefore received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk in Him. When you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and are born again, you acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior, and you obey from day one your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I remember a Professor of mine at seminary, Berkeley Michelson, used to say, faith without obedience is intellectual sin. Luther and the Reformers would always say, we are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. We are saved by a working faith. Christian life, one scholar has said, without obedience is like a car without a key. A Christian life without obedience is like a car without a key. Faith is a foundation. Obedience is the frame. Andrew Murray has said this, I only have as much of Jesus in me as I have the spirit of obedience. Alexander McLaren, that great 19th century preacher who was rated number two to Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and I think, sadly, how many people remember number two? But Alexander McLaren said this, Faith is the root of obedience. Obedience is the flower of of faith. Peter exhorted his persecuted believing readers to evidence obedience in their lives that would confirm their faith. It would strengthen their faith against the opposition. It would secure God's blessing. In chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, Paul, uh, Peter said to his persecuted readers, he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. For when his glory may be revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. And Jesus would reveal himself to them. Jesus, Hebrews 13, 5, the one who would never leave them nor forsake them. In John 14, 15, and 21, two of my favorite verses in the Bible, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John 14, 21, Jesus says, those who have my commandments and keep them, they are the ones who love me. And the ones who love me, the Father will love him, and I will love him, and I will reveal myself to him. There is a wonderful promise. And just think that what that would mean, not only to us as believers, but to persecuted believers around the world. In the original language, it's interesting that the world to obey speaks of something that's fast because it is prized. It refers to a careful observance of something of great value. The person who truly loves God treasures his commandments. His obedience is a direct reflection of the reality and quality of their spiritual life. Psalm 40, 6 through 8, Calvin referred to these verses as the way of salvation. My ears you have opened. Then I said, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. In 1 John, the third test of eternal life. How do we know that we are saved? 
Answer, keep his commandments. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and keeps not his commandment is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, and him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Are we truly God's children? The first point is God's children are obedient children. The second point is God's children are non-conforming children. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance. Friends, the main verb in the three verses in our text this morning, verses 14 through 16, is found in verse 15, and it's be holy. Since the believer hopes completely in the coming, the apocalypsis, the unveiling, the disclosing of the Lord Jesus Christ in verses 13 and 7, that means that he or she is to live holy now. Live a holy life now. And you and I ask ourselves, how does a believer attain to holiness in this world? The answer is by being a nonconformist to this world. And the world is defined as everything and everybody that's in opposition and in rebellion against God. You and I are to live lives nonconforming to our former lives apart from God. That is lives of paganism and idolatry. That's the essence what the end of verse 14 means. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Peter's believing readers came out of paganism and idolatry. They were separated from God's benevolent presence. John 3, 36. He that believeth in the Son hath everlasting life. He that does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Titus 3.3 3 is a definition of the world. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the spirit of disobedience, under the power of the spirit of the air, and were as others children of disobedience, children of wrath. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4. Peter there describes his readers before their conversion. In 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Paul exhorted his readers in Romans, just as Peter did his readers from Pontus, Galatia, Appadocia, Bithynia. Romans 12, 1 and 2, what did Paul say? He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service, and be not conformed to this world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we ask the question, what does it mean to be a nonconformist? There are many answers we can give, but it means to walk in contrast. As Oskina says, is the mother of clarity. You walk in contrast or, dis contrast or distinction from the world. We use the world, but we don't love it. We're in the world, but we're not of it. It's to be a tent dweller, not to be a home dweller. To be like Abraham in Hebrews 11.9, he dwelt in tents as in a foreign country. He looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. To be a nonconformist means to be par oikio and not kat oikio. Par oikio means a pilgrim, an alien, a stranger, a foreigner, as Peter says in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. Not to be a kat oikio, Revelation 3.10. Those in whom the tribulation comes. Those who dwell on the earth. Those who put down roots here. As if this is all there is. 
To be a nonconformist is to lay up treasures in heaven, not on earth. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. You lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. Thieves break through and steal, as opposed to those who truly are of God, who have their emphasis on heaven. They lay up treasures there where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Thieves do not break through and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. To be a nonconformist is to be a person is so, who is so heavenly minded, he is of more earthly good. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. To be a nonconformist is to be a person who incurs the opposition of the world. In John 15, 18 through 20, Jesus said to his disciples, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus said, Remember what I told you before. The servant is not above his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they receive my words, they will receive you also. You've heard me say over this pulpit many times, a Christian ought to be as distinguishable from those around him as a civilized man is among savages. When Adoniram Judson was pioneer missionary to Burma in Southeast Asia, when he'd go on his journeys through the villages and jungles of the poor benighted Korean natives, he used to be called by the natives, Jesus Christ man. Here comes Jesus Christ man. Has that ever been said of us who name the name of Christ? Here comes Jesus Christ woman. Here comes Jesus Christ man. Sadly, too often it is true. In modern evangelicalism today, as one scholar said, if most people were arrested for being Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict them. Why? Why is that so true? Because those who profess the name of Christ, they look, they act, and they talk just like the world. When the opposition of the world comes, the test for the Christian and his faith is whether he or she will maintain a nonconformist walk, a nonconformist walk, no matter what comes their way. I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. When Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in June of 1933, immediately what he did was he started shutting down opposition. Anybody who would speak and not conform to the, the Reich. What happened with the professing church was it became the Reich church. Rather than stand up for truth, they walked lockstep with Hitler and even pronounced Hitler above God, as it were, and signed an oath of allegiance to Hitler, the Reich Church. And out of that came Bonhoeffer and others, who, the few who followed and formed the Confessing Church. They were the nonconformists that bucked against Hitler and the Reich and humanism and atheism. Someone will say, well, how can I be a nonconformist? I don't have the strength for that, friends. We can't stockpile grace. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. God will provide the grace, the strength that we need when that comes to, make, to be a true nonconformist for Jesus and stand up for him. It was August 24th, 1662, when over 2,000 Puritan pastors who would not submit to the Anglican Church's act of uniformity left their pulpits. It has been called the great ejection. Those Puritan pastors who left their pulpits for conscience sake to remain true to the gospel, to remain true to Jesus Christ, they went to preach in barns, woods, homes, on horseback, wherever and whenever. And they were called by their opposition the nonconformists. They refused to take the oath of uniformity. Friends, nonconformity is a Christian virtue at all times. It's a Christian's proper response to God's truth. Jesus said in John 7, 7, 
The world hates me because I tell them that their deeds are evil. It may be costly for you and I to stand up for truth, just as it was for the Puritans in 1662 and just as it was for Bonhoeffer in the 1940s in Nazi Germany. But without it, J.I. Packer says this, churchmanship becomes irreligion and one's Christian profession becomes an insult to God. Let me repeat that. If you and I do not live lives of nonconformity, then in essence what can be said of our profession of Jesus Christ is, as J.I. Packer says, churchmanship becomes irreligion and one's Christian profession becomes an insult to God. Friends, we live in a compromising day when the professing church today is Laodicean. The professing church today thinks that it is rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing and doesn't realize that it is poor, blind, naked, and wretched. It's in need of repentance. Laodiceanism reigns and God's truth wanes. God blesses only those who persevere in truth, those who live uncompromising lives of nonconformity to the world. Remember, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One look at his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Matthew 25, 21, Jesus said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. And Jesus said in Revelation 3, 21, To those who overcome, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Are we truly God's children? The first point was God's children are obedient children. The second point is God's children are non-conforming children. And the third point is God's children are comprehensively holy children. Comprehensively holy children. Verses 15 and 16. But as he who has called you is holy, be holy in all manner of behavior. As it is written, be holy for I am holy. Verse 15 contains the main verb in this three verse section, be holy. It's the same word in the Greek that's found in 1 Corinthians 1-2. To the church of God, which is a Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Saints, the hagias of God. What is hagias in Scripture? It has a twofold meaning. It means to be pure. It means to be holy. It means to have moral integrity. And secondly, it means to be separate. It means to be separate from what is evil. And evil is the absence of good or the violation of God's standards, His goodness, on account of sin. 2 Corinthians 6.14 to 7.1. I'd like to read that section of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 6.14 to 7.1. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now this verse a lot of times is used for uh, don't marry someone uh, that is an unbeliever. But that's not the primary reference of this verse. The primary reference here is in contrast to false teachers. Don't be yoked to false teachers. Do not be unyoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what companion communion has light with darkness? And what concord is Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with a non-believer? And what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Believers keep themselves holy by not conforming to the world and by imitating their holy God. God in Christ sets the pattern for the believer. Precept begins... Example accomplishes. Jesus said in 1 Peter 2.21, For he even you're unto where he called, I've also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in my footsteps. Jesus in the upper room in John 13.15 and 17 said, 
I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul said to the, the believers in Corinth, be imitators of God as I imitate Christ. And he, to the Ephesian believers, Paul said, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. We're called to match God's holiness and goodness. And what's the standard for you and I? <laughs> Matthew 5.48, be therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven is imperfect. You and I know that in our sinful state, yet we can't reach that. Luther said that we are simultaneously justified and sinners. And that'll be true until we're glorified, when sin will no longer be present. But until then, you and I need to live lives of repentance, to keep short accounts with God unto purity and holiness. The reference here, in the text to calling, kaleo in the Greek, is to effectual calling, not to a general call. It's to an effectual call or an irresistible grace, which is a synonym for the effectual call, in which God infallibly brings people to himself. It's interesting. You probably remember when we went through the pastoral, distinction, uh, pastoral epistles, I made the distinction. When you come across the word calling or kaleo in scriptures, when the apostles use it in the, in the epistles, it always means the effectual call. It always means an irresistible grace. When Jesus uses the word kaleo in the Gospels, like in Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen. He uses it in reference to the general call that goes out to everybody, the general call. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 is a verse of effectual calling. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship, his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. In 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Effectual calling is the work of the Holy Spirit, affecting regeneration on the basis of our election. Ephesians 1.4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before us in love. And as the old Puritan said in light of that verse, God sees not as men sees, neither does he choose men because they are fit, but he fits them because he has chosen them. My Lord, I did not choose you, for that could never be. My heart would still refuse you had you not chosen me. You took the sin that stained me, cleansed me, made me new. Of old you have ordained me that I should live in you. Friends, it is God's absolute holiness that reveals sin to be sin. Only God is absolutely holy. Revelation 15, 4 says, only thou art holy. And we sang this morning, holy, holy, holy. I don't know if you noticed that. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though of eye of sinful man, thy glory cannot see. Only thou art holy. There is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. And the hymn writer had it exactly right. You and I that are partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4, are only that in a relative sense. It only applies to God in the absolute sense. And it's the absolute, perfect, pure holiness of God that reveals sin to be sin. And what does that do? That necessitates the cross work of Jesus Christ. It calls for the incarnation. It calls for redemption the necessity of it, and it provides for it. Martin Lloyd-Jones was once asked the question, why must I start with the holiness of God rather than with the love of God? And he said these remarks in reply to 1 John 1, 5, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And just think, in our day and age, the emphasis is not on the holiness of God. It's all on the love of God. And what is forgotten, that God's love is an absolutely holy love. An absolutely holy love. Martin Lloyd-Jones, among other things, replied this. Why must we start with the holiness of God rather than the love of God? He said this. If you do not start with the holiness of God, you'll never understand God's plan of salvation. The holiness of God demands the cross. It demands the incarnation. Without starting with holiness, the cross is meaningless. David Wells in God in the Wasteland said, the holiness of God requires in those who approach him the echo of his holiness. 
Hmm. Is that our aim and passion in life? The echo of God's holiness be seen in us? I'm paraphrasing here C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, as rabbits beget rabbits, as horses beget horses, as human beings beget human beings, not statutes or portraits, then, friends, a holy God begets holy children. You'll note an interesting word in verse 15 that I've circled in my Bible. <laughs> but as he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of behavior. Circle the word all, all manner of behavior. That is absolutely comprehensive. The injunction for you and I to embrace holiness embraces all of life. There's no sphere of our life that is outside the control of God. That's outside of his demands, his commandments, his dominion. God calls his children to holiness. And I ask the question today, how are you and I doing on our holiness quotient? <laughs> are we daily increasing in holiness? Are we daily increasing in pleasing God? Are we increasing in sanctification? 1 John 2, 6, He that says he abides in him ought himself also so to walk as he walked. 1 Peter 1, 15, As he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of behavior. Verse 16, you know there that it quotes scripture. As it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And that is taken from the book of Leviticus. We don't know, particularly scholars don't know what verse, because there's so many of those verses in Leviticus. Because one of the themes that pervades Leviticus, that book that you and I read all the time, is holiness. In fact, chapters 18 through 20 is called the holiness code. Be holy am I am holy. Leviticus 19.2, 20 verse 6, 20 verse 26. But what Peter did here is made a general call, a general quote from the book of Leviticus. He called these persecuted believers to live a life of holiness. It reiterates the thought for you and I that because God is holy, you and I who name the name of Christ, we are to be holy too. A holy God begets holy children. And holy children are to imitate, Im imitate their holy father. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, Peter's definition of the church. For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you are called to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who, not, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Are we truly God's children? We've looked at three points this morning. God's children are obedient children. God's children are non-conforming children. And God's children are comprehensively holy children. Sinclair Ferguson tells the story of the royal family in England. One day the royal queen, mother, was going to take her royal children to a formal event that she was expected to attend. And as the royal queen mother left the royal palace, the royal butler observed the royal children misbehaving. And on the way to the royal limousine, the royal chauffeur overheard the royal mother as she stopped to address her royal children. She bent over and said, Remember, royal children, royal manners. Just as Peter reminded his readers in the first century, so I remind each of us today. We're called of God, his royal children. And as such, we are called to be holy, to follow in the steps of our royal, holy Father. Ephesians 5.1, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. We're called to be obedient to his commands and to evidence that as pilgrims in Christ, that we're different. We are different from a hell-bound world around us. 1 John 3, 1 and 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God or the children of God, and such we are. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. 
Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Royal children, royal manners. Is that true of us who name the name of Christ? Our hope is grounded in Christ and his coming, as it says in verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in that light, by God's grace, you and I are, desire, are to desire to live holy lives before God in a watching world. As obedient children, not conforming ourselves to the former lusts in our ignorance. But as he who has called us is holy, so be holy in all manner of behavior. As it is written, be holy, for I am holy. May our prayer be that of the hymn writer. Jesus calls us by thy mercy, Savior. May we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thine obedience. Serve and love thee best of all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word of truth. I pray that your spirit of truth, who guides us into truth, enlightens our minds, would engrave these truths on our hearts today. That we indeed would be royal children with royal manners. And we would acknowledge that a holy father begets holy children. And holy children are to live to imitate their holy father and make him known. That's our responsibility. 